It is such an honor to sit across from one of my absolute heroes, Greg Braden, written books including The Divine Matrix, The God Code, Human by Design. You read my books? <laughs> I read all of them, Greg. I'm okay. a massive fan. I've been following you. your work for years. Um, also, of course, Missing Links on Gaia, mm. which was so pleased to see you come out with your information. And yeah. it did fill in some links for me. So important. And that's why we're sitting here today. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the, the privilege of being a part of this. I think it's really important information that we're sharing because we're, we're covering topics that people typically don't talk about in their everyday lives. On the one hand, the other hand, these are the very topics that change the way we think about ourselves, our relationship to our own bodies and our relationship to other people in the world and help us solve our problems in a healthy way. And I think that's what we're all looking for. That just touches me deep in the oh, heart because that's what it's all about. Yeah. Shall we start there? Yes. Heart intelligence. All right. Aligning the head and the heart. <clears throat> new discoveries are giving us a new way to think about ourselves in general and specifically our relationship to our bodies in the world. And, and many of those new discoveries are now focused on the human heart. And this is beyond metaphor and it's beyond uh, new thought. Uh, kind of uh, airy-fairy kinds of, of relationships that many people have shied away from in the past. This is rock-solid, peer-reviewed science. What the science is telling us is that there are about 40,000 specialized cells located in each human heart. Scientists say they discovered them. The truth is they've always been there. They simply have recognized them. Only recently, 1991, this, uh, the recognition of these cells was published in a peer-reviewed journal of neurocardiology. And just the word of the journal tells the story, neurocardiology is brain and heart. There's a very different way of thinking. These specialized cells, they're called sensory neurites. And they are essentially brain-like cells, but they're not in the cranial brain. They're in the heart. However, they perform precisely the same functions as neurons in the brain. These cells in our heart think independently of the human brain. They remember they feel and they sense independently of the human brain. Now this opens the door to a whole new way of thinking about our relationship to our heart for a number of reasons. First of all, when we have an experience and we record that experience in our memory, we traditionally think of that memory as being in the brain. And if it's a good memory, there is no problem, but many of us have trauma that has never been resolved and that trauma tends to reside, the chemical, the chemical equivalent of every experience is called a neuropeptide. And these neuropeptides either metabolize out of our bodies when we release the emotion. So in joy, there's no reason to retain that emotion. We don't get stuck in joy. You don't hear people say, you know, I've got so much joy in my life. Can you help me dial it back a little bit? You don't hear that. Trauma, uh, our deepest hurts our greatest fears, our betrayals, our disappointments. When those happen to us, sometimes we're very young in life and sometimes uh, even into adulthood, we don't have the tools to deal with these experiences. Those neuropeptides cannot metabolize out of the body. They're not free. They're anchored in the organs that we tend to associate with our trauma. Now, when we are hurt, a lot of that comes from the heart. And this is where it gets really interesting because those neuropeptides will reside in those tissues and those organs until we have the tools to resolve them uh, or until they light up for us is what we would call a, a, a dysfunction in that tissue or that organ, an illness or a disease. So understanding that our heart is holding information, memories, as well as the brain, when we go to someone uh, a therapist, for example, to help us work through the hurts of the past. If we do it only by talking about what's in our brain, it helps, can help. But often we feel like it's incomplete. Now we know the reason why, because we only address some of the information. What about the information that lives in our hearts? Now that we are beginning to understand the role of these neurons in our heart, we can actually address the heart in a language that the heart recognizes. So this is where the science is leading now. Actually, the heart has been, uh, is no longer considered simply a muscle. It has now been redefined as an organ because it is recognized as generating hormones as well. The heart generates its own hormones. So what we now are beginning to understand is not only 
uh, is the heart important in terms of, of cellular memory and, and uh, the memory of our experiences? As humans, we are extraordinary powerful beings in ways that we're only beginning to understand. And we're the only form of life that can consciously choose to harmonize the neurons in the heart and the neurons in the brain, two separate organs, harmonize them into a single potent system that serves us in terms of self-regulation. It gives us the ability to self-regulate our biology in a way that no other form of life can do. When we harmonize the heart and the brain, two organs become a single potent system. We open the door to this potential of self-regulation uh, in so many ways, simply harmonizing the heart and the brain. It enhances our immune response almost immediately. It helps increase what is called heart rate variability, the beat to beat, how much time between one beat and the next uh, in our, our heart rate. When we're young, we have a tremendous variability. As we age, we typically lose that variability. And when we do that, we lose our resilience to change in life. The greater the heart rate variability, the more resilience we have to change. All of our lives are changing. We need that resilience. Harmonizing the heart and the brain is one of the ways to regain that resilience by increasing heart rate variability. We harmonize the heart and the brain. We open the door to very, very powerful states of super memory, super cognition, super recall. We have the ability to access deep states of intuition on demand. We all have intuition and usually it's spontaneous. You go to pick up the phone to call someone and they're already on the other line and you say, how did that happen? And I wonder if it'll happen again. And you wait for the universe to give you your next spontaneous experience of, of intuition. But our power, where we find our deepest levels of mastery is when we create those kinds of experiences, those synchronicities, those deep states of intuition when we, when we need them the most. And when we need them the most is typically when the world is least conducive to the experience. So how do we access these on demand? The ability to harmonize the heart and the brain is the key. So our ancestors knew this for over 5,000 years. Indigenous traditions, uh, monks and nuns in, in Tibet uh, that I've visited, and the shamans and the healers and the Kurandaros and the mystics and the yogis have all had techniques leading to the harmonization of the heart and the brain that science didn't really take seriously, didn't understand why they were doing these techniques. And now we know, and they've been validated in the laboratory, and there are techniques of, of focus of awareness, number one. Number two, regulation of the breath, which is a language unto itself with the human body. And number three, the ability to create emotion in the heart when we choose to have the emotion rather than depending upon the outside world, the external world, to give us a reason to have the emotion. Now, this is important because we are conditioned to respond to the world around us. Rarely are we expected to create the emotion because we choose to have the emotion, but it is the emotion in the heart that sends a signal to the brain that determines what kind of chemistry that brain releases into our bodies. Positive, uplifting emotions send healing, rejuvenating, revitalizing chemistry, and, and when we are in fear or we feel vigilant, we don't feel safe in our world, then we are sending a signal. It's a very jagged signal, a rough signal from the heart to the brain, and the brain responds with stress chemistry, cortisol, adrenaline, uh, and, and things that we need for brief periods of time. Those are good chemis chemicals, but we don't want to live our lives every day with those kinds of chemicals flowing through our body in, in a world of 24 seven news media showing us problems with no way to resolve the problems. We tend to become a stressed society and statistics are showing this. Uh, the, the world is sicker now. The America, American society is, uh, the statistics are showing since 9-11 uh, are living in greater vigilance, greater fear, uh, and it's being reflected in higher levels of stress, stress-related diseases, inflammation, cancers, all of those things. So the ability to self-regulate our biology is a very, very powerful key to help us regulate what's happening within us. We may not be able to change what's happening in the world around us. We definitely can change how we respond 
to the world around us. And it begins in the human heart. The mechanics of the heart, the science of the heart. You really got into that. I want to know what is electric and what is magnetic in terms of thoughts, feelings, deeds, beliefs. Our relationship to our planet, uh, we're really only beginning to understand in a, in a scientific perspective. Although intuitively, I think we all feel deeply connected to the world around us. Uh, I'm going to just give uh, an example. I'm a degree geologist. And as a geologist, even in the 1970s, uh, when I was studying the magnetic fields of the Earth, what we found was that the magnetic fields were changing. And my immediate question was, what does that mean to us? because we're living in those fields. So I'd ask my geologist friends and they kind of had their little blinders on. They said, don't ask me, I'm a geologist. I don't know anything about biology, go ask a biologist. So I'd ask my biologist friends and they'd say, don't ask me, I'm just a biologist. We don't talk about magnetic fields, go ask you know, a physicist. And it's a beautiful example of the way we have been taught to think to compartmentalize the world that we live in, in the natural forces, in the little boxes that we're comfortable studying called chemistry, biology, geology, physics. And the truth is, nature doesn't work that way. Nature doesn't know about those boxes. There is a world out there and there are natural forces and fields and the magnetic fields of our planet uh, are, are a very, very powerful part of our lives every day. Every form of life is influenced by the magnetic fields of the earth. Every blade of grass, every bacteria, every hamster, every goldfish, every CEO of every corporation, every leader of every nation. Though there truly is no them and us, there's a we when it comes to the magnetic fields. When we look at the human heart, the optimum frequency to harmonize the brain and the heart is a very, very low frequency, 0.1 hertz, 0.1 cycles per second. And this is no accident. And as a geologist, I find this fascinating because if you look at a graph, of the magnetic field frequencies for the planet, the first big spike on that graph is 0.1 hertz. What that means is that when we harmonize our heart and our brain, self-regulating this powerful force within us, not only are we harmonizing the organs and systems within our body, we are harmonizing our body to the greater body that we live on. We're actually harmonizing our biology to the magnetic fields of a planet. And this is where healing begins. Healing is nothing more, nothing less than the alignment, the harmonization of the cells with these forces. And we find ourselves in dysfunction and disease. It boils down to one of two conditions, either too much of something we don't need or not enough of something that we do need. Those can be nutritional, but they can also be emotional. They can also be uh, our relationship to our planet. So as we harmonize the heart and the brain, we bring ourselves into this alignment. Now, the beauty of this is you don't have to know any of the science. And our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions, all focused in the human heart, they weren't scientists. They didn't tell us the nuts and bolts of how it works. They told us why it works and what to do. Now, this is the really beautiful place where for me, the, the rubber meets the road, the spiritual rubber of our hearts and our intuition meet the, the, the road of everyday life. And science and spirituality are coming together in a really beautiful and very useful way. So science we can think of is essentially a mystical language, the contemporary mystical language. So it is a, a neutral language. It doesn't have the baggage of religion or spirituality. So many people, they're more open to listening uh, and embracing the scientific terminology. Yeah. You are, for me, the embodiment, the physical embodiment of science and spirituality in a way, mm. your work, um, your, your career and how you've bridged, you know, being from the geology background mm, thank you. and moving into uh, the realm of spirituality and having the courage to do so, which I think is amazing. You touched on something from that perspective that I think is so important. And that's, we all bang on about our carbon footprint. Mm. And that's really important, of course. Sure. But what about our emotional footprint? What about our emotional diet? What about the emotional metabolism? So the human emotion is, uh, is a realm of study that science has neglected and chosen to discount for so very, very long. And I find this fascinating uh, as a scientist as well as a scholar, because it is the power of human emotion that gives us our unique abilities, no other form of life, through the power of emotion can achieve the kinds of things that we can achieve in terms of 
self-regulation within our bodies, but also in terms of our relationship to the world around us. And I find this fascinating because it is the emotion that was written right out of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions. For example, the biblical traditions of the West. Scholars know that uh, approximately 43 books were removed from the biblical canon in the fourth century by the, uh, uh, the Emperor Constantine during the Council of Nicaea in the fourth century. We know this because the books have been recovered intact in places like the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were the oldest records of the Old Testament, and the Nag Hammadi Library found on the banks of uh, the Nile River in Egypt, the village of Nag Hammadi. These are the newest records of the New Testament. And in the New Testament records, we find records such as the Gospel of Thomas. And the Gospel of Thomas uh, is believed to be written by a scribe that followed the master teacher, Jesus, as he toured and spoke uh, to the, the people, his disciples, as well as, as the masses. So I'm speaking about Jesus as a learned master, not necessarily as a religious figure, and I think it's important to make that distinction. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that there was a Jesus. He definitely existed. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, and he was a very learned man when it comes to our relationship with our bodies and spiritual principles. So we find him speaking to us about how to access our heart uh, in ways that science is traditionally discounted, and especially with males, with men. Men in the Western culture have been taught to deny their emotions, to stuff the emotions, to simply not acknowledge them. We were taught that the trauma was all in our mind, is what we taught us, just the way that you think about things and to discount the hurt. And it was good. I, I learned a lot from that. But in all of those experiences, I was always taught, and people would just say to me, suck it up. That was the term, suck it up. You are, you're a man and deal with it. And I did to the best of my ability. But now what I realize as an adult is that it is the very emotion that results from our betrayals, from our hurts, from our fears that can either be the source of our greatest strength or the, the source of what destroys us. And Jesus said this in the Nag Hammadi library. He says, if you bring forth that which is within you, it will save you. If you deny that which, that which is within you, it will destroy you. And these are what we are now finding about the emotions. Now we know this is the truth of the emotions that are either resolved and reconciled so that the neuropeptides are allowed to move freely or unresolved that are stored in the tissues and organs that we associate with our trauma uh, until we either resolve them or if they are stored long enough unresolved, they will show up as inflammation, as a dysfunction to call our attention to the organ so that we may resolve them. And when we, we talk about the resolution of emotion chemically. Candace Pert, the uh, Harvard-trained MD that wrote the book Molecules of Emotion, a brilliant, brilliant uh, work, she actually defined what does it mean to, to heal. And from a perspective of these neuropeptides that result from unresolved trauma, it is simply allowing them to flow freely in the body and metabolize out of the body. When they metabolize, they come out in breath, urine, perspiration, the way that we typically uh, excrete from the body. So all we're trying to do is to get these chemicals freed and released. And there are a number of ways to do that. Oxygenating the body through breath will do that, breath techniques. Uh, and by redefining, giving a different significance to the things that have hurt us in the past. And this is where the heart comes in. Because the brain, we're taught to think about our trauma through the brain, through our mind. And the brain is a polarity organ. It's a left brain, a right brain. So when we consider our actions, our choices, our past, from the perspective of our brain, there will always be a right and a wrong, a good and a bad, success and a failure. The heart, however, is not a polarity organ. And this is this is such a beautiful part of our design. It's just brilliant the way that our heart uh, engages our experience from this perspective because our heart is not polarity. So when we think about, when we, when we give uh, consideration to the things that have happened to us from the place of a balanced heart in the brain, 
from that perspective. We're not looking at it through the polarity. We're not going through the logic loops of good, bad, and right, and wrong, and the ego that keeps us from accessing our deepest healing from our heart. Our heart, it's called heart intelligence. Using these 40,000 neurons in the heart, a heart will access these memories very objectively, and it helps us to give new meaning. It doesn't change what's happened. It gives new meaning to our experiences so that we can observe them, learn from them, honor them, and let them go, rather than feeling the guilt and the shame of all of our experience that keeps those hurts chemically locked into our bodies. Do you believe we live in addictive and addicted society? Honestly, the world was very different in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, there's a post-World War II generation. We didn't know then what we know now, and people, I believe, did the best they could with what they understood. They were learning from their parents and from the previous generation that was a wartime generation. And, uh, and there are patterns that are shared from one generation to the next. Uh, there is a part of us in the neocortex in the brain, we have specialized neurons called mirror neurons. And the mirror neurons don't know the difference between watching an experience and us actually having the experience. When we see someone, here's a perfect example, a Sunday afternoon soccer game on television, we can be watching on the couch, lying down, motionless. Our heart is racing. We're perspiring. Our muscles are tense, but we aren't even moving. Our mirror neurons don't know the difference between us on that soccer field and us watching someone on the soccer field. And this is important because these mirror neurons can serve us in very powerful ways. If we see a healing of another person, our brain doesn't know the difference between watching and experiencing. So our brain will begin to produce the chemistry that matches that healing. When we see behavior patterns that are unhealthy behavior patterns from a dysfunctional family, we begin to mimic those as well, consciously and, and subconsciously. So in this way, it's not unusual for young people to have an alcoholic or an addictive personality without ever touching a drug or a drop of alcohol because they have learned to respond to life, to solve life's problems and deal with life through the eyes of the addiction from their parents. Their mirror neurons are mimicking what it is that they've learned. So the good news is that we never are the victim of our past unless we choose to be defined by our past. And many people simply do not know that. Many people believe that because of their childhood, their upbringing, or their early adult life, and because of the, the bad things that have happened to them, that they have been put onto a path that they cannot recover from. And if they believe that, then that will become their life. We are beings of choice. And we always have the ability to heal from within, to recognize the past that's brought us to the present moment, and to make new choices, healthy choices that move us forward. And as we make those choices inwardly for ourselves, they begin to influence what is available to us in the external world by becoming healthier from within, by changing the way we think about ourselves, the way we see ourselves. When we talked about the mirror neurons, the mirror neurons will fire under one or two conditions. When they see someone having experience or when we actually have the experience, the seeing does not have to happen externally. The seeing can be the vision that we hold in our mind. When we imagine ourselves and we visualize and we see ourselves, how do we see ourselves? This is the question. What do you feed your mirror neurons? every moment of every day? Do you feed your mirror neurons the inadequacies that you perceive uh, or the shortcomings that you perceive? And if so, your mirror neurons don't know the difference between you seeing it and someone else doing it, and they'll begin to produce the chemistry. And don't be surprised if you embody those shortcomings to deeper and deeper and deeper levels. But they will respond very, very quickly when we consciously choose to see ourselves in a new light healthy, vital, life-affirming chemistry in our body is, is, uh, is ignited because we are beings, we've all heard the term neuroplasticity, where we can change the neurons uh, and the way they fire in our brain. 
That term now extends to the DNA. We are genetically plastic, genetic plasticity, bioplasticity. All of our body, every organ in the body is now documented with the ability to heal itself, to stop the damage, to repair what's happened and to grow new tissue, even the organs we were told could not. Brain tissue, spinal cord tissue, heart tissue, pancreatic tissue, it's called epigenetics. It is our body, our DNA responding to the environment that we give that to respond to. And the environment can be external, nutrition, certainly, chemical environment, but a big part of it, perhaps the largest part is the internal environment, thoughts, feelings, emotions, and beliefs. And these are all functions of a sentient being. This is our sensory world that we live in. No other form of life, no other form of life right now is recognized to have the ability to consciously awaken these extraordinary potentials within us and to modify and change and tweak and hone and refine the qualities that we represent within ourselves and that we choose to share with the world. We're the only form of life. And that is the greatest gift. However, when I feel down in the dumps, I've had my heart broken sure. or whatever, it doesn't feel like a gift at all when I'm stuck in that negative <clears> feeling. <throat> um, and one of my favorite quotes is a Rumi quote that says, the wound is where the light enters. Yeah. Do you think there's intrinsic value to the negative charge? <clears throat> When we talk about the hurts of life, one of the things that I learned very early is that my hurt was directly linked to my perception of the hurt. What I recognized is that the person that I blamed for the hurt did what they felt they needed to do in their lives. And the only way it was possible for me to hurt was to compare what happened in that moment to another moment. And think about this. Because when the moment is all that there is, and there is no past that you're comparing it to, the moment feels very differently. So what I found was that my emotions were very, very closely linked with the expectations uh, and my attachment to my past, whether that past was an hour ago or whether that past was a year ago. <clears throat> Knowing this, I began to experiment with myself and say, what if, what if now is all there is? How would I feel about my partner breaking up with me or my friend betraying me? How would I feel about that? It doesn't change what happens because we can't always change what happens. We are definitely empowered to change the way we respond to what happens. And if you think about your life, when your heart is broken and when you feel betrayed, it typically is because we are making a comparison between the moment and something in the past. And the question is, what do we use as our frame of reference? What do we use as that point of reference? The same is true with self-esteem. When people say, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to be in better shape, or uh, I'd like to be a better artist, or I'd like to be a better musician. And I understand the intent, and I, and I think it's good to want to improve. But we can only be better. This is really subtle. That's very, very powerful. We can only think that we need to be better when we are comparing what we are now to something else. If we are not making that comparison, all we are is what we are in the moment. And if, if we have truly done, I'll, I'll speak to our viewers, if they have truly done what they believe is, is their best effort in the moment, then there cannot be anything any better. So I was asked recently uh, about my failures in life. Greg, what are your greatest failures in life? And my answer was not what the interviewer was expecting. Because from my perspective, uh, I honestly believe I have no failures in my life. There are many times when the outcome has not been what I thought the outcome was going to be. But what I have chosen to do is when I go forward with anything in life, if I say yes to an invitation, if I say yes to a commitment, and I'm in 100%, and I do all that I could possibly do given those circumstances in that moment, and I could do nothing else, that's all I could do. And it's impossible for me to fail. Now, the outcome, I may have expectations of an outcome that change, but I've never thought of that as a failure. And I know it's subtle, and it's a very different way of thinking, but it also has freed me from the polarity of the success-failure paradigm 
uh, and allowed me to move forward with new choices in, in my life. And I continue. I'm a student. I am a student of understanding myself, my relationship to the world, and I continue to do these things. So, for example, I, I know many speakers or musicians. I'm a musician when I'm not writing books who walk off the stage at night and immediately begin to criticize what they've done. They say, I should have done this or, you know, this didn't sound the way I wanted it to. Or, and they will beat themselves up for hours or days after that performance. And when I'm with those people, I will ask them, given the circumstances, given the sound system you had, given the lighting you had, given the, the climate control you had, the environment that you were performing in, is there any way you could have done better? And they say, well, no, you know, I did the best I could with that. And I said, then how could you possibly fail? And it's a very, very different way of thinking. But for me, it has freed me from the shackles of the success failure paradigm and allowed me to look honestly at what I do in a healthy way and make healthy choices. You talked a lot about emotional yeah. regulation. And in so, my opinion, sentience sort of uh, is, a, is a meeting point of consciousness and emotional regulation. So when we talk about harmonizing the heart and the brain, three very simple steps. The first step is to shift the awareness from the mind into the heart. And the indigenous people typically will do this by simply touching their heart center in a way that is comfortable for them because the awareness immediately goes to the place where you feel that touch. It's the first step. And then the second step is they will breathe a little bit slower, slow, the typical breathing. And when we slow our breathing, we're sending a very powerful signal to our body that we are safe. And when we feel safe, there's a little switch, an emotional switch that begins to send a different chemistry into the body from the brain, a life-affirming chemistry of healing and rejuvenation rather than the stress chemistry of fight or flight. Second step. The third step is consciously and intentionally feeling in a positive, uplifting emotion because we choose to feel it. Maybe the world's not giving us anything to respond to, but we choose to feel. And typically one or some combination of four emotions fill that function, gratitude, appreciation, care, or compassion. One of those four typically will work for pretty much everyone. When we harmonize the heart and the brain, we are moving ourselves out of the polarity thinking of the rightness or the wrongness of what has happened to us in the past. It is only in the brain and we're bringing those heart neurons into the equation. A part of my blood heritage is, uh, is Southeastern Cherokee from Oklahoma in the US. And there is a word for this heart focus that doesn't even exist in the English language, but the Cherokee have used this. It's called Shante Ishta. Shante Ishta means the single eye of the heart. It's the eye that does not see the polarity of the rightness or the wrongness or the goodness or the badness. It's the eye that will discern safety and fear, but it will never judge another being and it will never judge us. It will never judge me. So when I can look at my past, my history, my hurts from within this place of heart-brain harmony, then the wrongness of what was done to me or my shortcomings uh, of shame or the, the hurt that I felt those all take a back seat. And what I begin to see and feel is that the experience, uh, it's almost beyond words, but the experience does not have the emotional charge that holds me locked into the, uh, the, the negative space, uh, the body chemistry or the emotional space. And it, it frees me, as I've said before, it frees me to move forward in a healthy way uh, from having had the experience that I can't change. So this is where the, the electrical fields and the magnetic fields all come into play. What we now know is that the heart has the strongest electrical, it is the strongest bioelectrical generator in the body and it's the strongest biomagnetic generator in the body. When I was in school, I was taught that the brain is electrical and magnetic, and it is but it pales in comparison to the heart. The heart is about 5,000 times stronger than the brain magnetically and about 100 times stronger than the brain uh, electrically. Now think about what this means. We lived in the electrical and the magnetic world, electromagnetic fields all around us. 
And we are constantly interacting with these fields. We're wired to do that. Our neurons are wired to do that. So if we're going to interact with our electromagnetic world through an organ that is designed to do just this, it makes perfect sense it would be the heart because the heart is literally wired to interact with the world around us, not the brain. This is why sometimes it's difficult to think through the solution to the problem, whereas feeling through the solution to the problem is a very successful outcome. And this is one of the, the deep truths of our most ancient and cherished spiritual traditions that is only now being understood by modern science because the equipment is validating these relationships. I'm investigating the concept that feeling is healing. And what I'm learning from you mm. is that feeling is prayer as well. Would you agree with both of those statements? <clears throat> prayer researchers identify multiple kinds of prayer and everyone has, uh, has a place. Uh, for me, prayer is like a tool. It's like if we have a, a toolbox, different tools can be used for different things, different prayers may be used for different things. There are prayers of supplication. For example, where we feel powerless to do anything in our world and we ask for intervention. Dear God, if you let my car get to the bottom of the freeway this one time, I will never let my gas tank get this low again. That, that's a prayer of supplication. There are prayers um, where we literally petition a higher power. Uh, mighty I am. I petition the Lord for the right to heal and be healed now and in all past, present, and future generations. That's a petitionary prayer. There is a form of prayer that typically has not been recognized by modern prayer researchers, and it is the form of prayer that is used by the indigenous peoples to do seemingly miraculous things, including the healing of the body, and it is a feeling-based prayer. It is feeling the feeling as if the prayer has already been accomplished rather than asking an external force to perform this thing, this healing or this miracle for us. The difference in this mode of prayer is we become part of the solution rather than feeling powerless and asking for an external intervention. When we feel the feeling that our perfect relationship is already present, our abundance is already present, the healing in our body has already happened, we set into motion a cascade of events that reflect that feeling that modern physics is only beginning to bear out through quantum theory, uh, entanglement, the principle of us interconnectedness, of us being connected to the world beyond our body as well as the world within our bodies. The heart and heart-brain connection, these are the, the, the tools, they provide the mechanism for us to make these communications. So prayer, when we say prayer, a feeling-based prayer does have the potential to influence the world outside of our bodies through electrical and magnetic and quantum forces. We're only beginning to understand, but it also has the ability through that feeling, when we feel the feeling that we are already healed, for example, if we go into the heart-brain coherence without the attachment to the outcome, okay, and we're feeling the feeling and we can see that in our mind, our mirror neurons are seeing the healing in the presence of a field that supports that healing without the judgment, without the attachment, without the goodness or the badness or the rightness or the wrongness. And this is what frees us, frees our body to respond very, very quickly. Healing, what we call healing, uh, is harmony. It's bringing our body into harmony with itself and with the forces of the, the planet that we live upon. And heart-based harmony, heart-brain harmony and heart-based prayer uh, are ancient tools that have been validated in modern laboratories now that tell us precisely how this works and what to do. And that brings us into the realm of intention. And sure. one of my favorite quotes I've read from you is, be the change you want to see in the world. Sure. Why is that so? So when we look at the instructions from those who have learned these principles in the past. They weren't scientists, but they really understood our relationship to the world. So we've all heard, for example, a biblical passage, ask and you shall receive. And I know people that ask and ask and ask. I did when I was young, nothing happens. And you say, well, my prayers don't work or I must be a powerless being. This is one of the examples where the phrase lost in translation 
really takes on a great significance because when we go to the original versions of the Gospels that carry those instructions, these again were given by the Master, Jesus, not as a religious icon, but as a very learned man. He was an Essene, and the ancient Essenes were called therapeutae in their time because they knew how to heal. They understood, they understood this relationship between, between the heart and the brain and, and the world. You go to those original texts before the translations condensed and edited the text. They read just a little differently, and that little difference is what makes the big difference and all the difference in the world. Because what they say, ask and you shall receive, be surrounded by your joy. Be surrounded by your desire so that your joy can be full. So the only way to be, when we be, it means the healing or the outcome is already present. It means we're living, this is a quantum principle. We're living in the present moment. We're not asking for it to come from somewhere else. We're claiming that it is already there. Be surrounded. This is the key. Be surrounded by your joy. Be surrounded by your healing. Be surrounded by your desire so that your gladness may be full. And this is 2,000, 2,200 years ago. This is the way that this information was conveyed. And I'm, I'm in awe at how accurate it was uh, and how well it has survived, even to the present day in the form that it is right now. So when we talk about intention, what we're talking about is, is the combination of it's not enough to see the outcome. I know people that have done a lot of what they call visualization and they're frustrated because it seems like nothing happens. But if you think of the heart-brain system in terms of high technology, very sophisticated, soft biological technology, not machines, tissue that's doing what machines, what we now have designed the machines to do are mirroring what we already do from within. So if you think about that, it makes perfect sense. That in our mind, we would simulate the possibilities and model the possibilities and, and get it just right. Nothing's going to happen until we imbue that possibility with the power to bring it into our lives. And that's where the heart comes in. It is our love or our gratitude or our appreciation for that possibility that breathes life into the possibility. Now, I mentioned earlier Scientists have found one or some combination of, of four words, typically, uh, will create this positive emotion between the heart and the brain, gratitude, appreciation, compassion, and care. And people often ask me, well, what about the word love? Greg, why isn't love you know, one of those words? And it's a really good question. And I asked the researchers, and they said, this is interesting, Greg, is what they told me because love means different things to different people. And for many people, love has not been a good experience. So there is a lot of charge on the word love. And love typically, the word itself typically does not work. However, if you think about it, gratitude is a facet of love. Appreciation is a facet of love, care, compassion. So what we're talking about all fall under the umbrella of love. There are facets of love without using the word love itself. It's That's taking the condition out of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And finding the true altruism. And I feel like that's the ticket. It's certainly what I feel like keeps me sober every day. Mm. And that's my 24 hour reprieve. Um, and that's how I, I choose to live my life consciously. It works thank for you. me. Yeah, well, thank you for, <laughs> thank you for your healing. Something I really noticed in your book, Human by Design, huh. is that you broke everything down to value and worth. Hmm. Is our collective crisis that we find ourselves in today really down to that? Do we value life? Do we value ourselves enough? We're living in a time unlike anything we've seen in 5,000 years of recorded human history. One of the, the principles that makes now so very different is globalization. So there are approximately 8 billion people, almost 8 billion people on the planet. And what we used to call the borders and the boundaries of oceans and mountains and geography and continents don't really mean the same thing any longer. So we are globalizing, we're pushing together over, over almost 8 billion people on the one hand, and we're asking ourselves 
to make sense of this globalization through the thinking that's based in separation. So we have new cultures and different languages and different religions and the way that men think about women and the way women think about men that we've always become accustomed to in our own little pods. And now as we globalize, we're coming together. We've been taught, it's all a product of our thinking. We've been taught that we're separate from one another. We've been taught to judge. So there is a lot of fear when something new, when a new culture, a new religion comes into our community, and that fear is often expressed as hate. And we are seeing an emergence of hate in the world based upon the color of our skin, upon our sexual orientation, upon our religion, in ways that we've never seen before, and people don't know what to do about that. So governments are passing laws making it illegal to speak hate or to do hateful acts. And I think that might be a step in the right direction, but ultimately those laws don't change the way we think. If you make it illegal to hate, you just will not express it, but you may still be feeling it. If we're really going to do more than put a bandage on the hate that's emerging in the world, we've got to go to the core of where the problem comes from. And it's only possible because of the way we've been taught to think. We've been told a story of human origin that says that we're the product of a random process, some, some very lucky biology that just happened to occur a long time ago, and that competition has been the rule of nature that has allowed us to be successful. Now, these ideas were encapsulated by Charles Darwin in 1859 in the book called Origin of Species. And I know that sounds like a long time ago, but it's important because the foundation of the society that we live in right now was being put in place during the late 1800s, early 1900s. So the foundation of our economic system is based on competition, Darwin's ideas. It's the, the foundation of our corporate systems, the way that we have been taught to deal with one another in terms of nations, in terms of communities, but it even comes down to our most intimate relationships. When we are in the privacy of our own home, and our vulnerabilities are most present, the people that know us the most, when we have a disagreement, they'll often go for the most hurtful things to say to us, that is a product of thinking uh, of, of this competition, dog eat dog world. And the problem with this is that it's based upon a false assumption. The best science of the 20th and now the 21st centuries are telling us that nature is actually based on a model of cooperation, not competition. And that while we see competition, I mean, we have to be real, uh, competition certainly exists. The greater the degree of competition, that tells us how far we've strayed from the natural harmony and the natural order of, uh, of the natural world. So when we're looking for sustainable solutions to the problems between nations, or we're looking for sustainable healing in our most intimate relationships, the model that is probably the closest to what is going to bring joy and harmony in our lives is a model based upon nature, and that is cooperation. It's about honest, truthful, factual communication. And this is where heart-brain harmony can become so powerful, because we're having a very difficult conversation with a, a partner, a life partner, a spouse, or a sibling, or, or a child, or in the workplace, or uh, in in the, the university with a professor, if we go in from our mind, then our mind is already poised for competition. And we're looking at the rightness, the wrongness, the goodness, the badness, uh, the implications. When we harmonize the heart and the brain, <clears throat> we are no longer in the polarity of the mind. And we free ourselves from that polarity. We become much more objective to what is said to us, much less reactive when something hurtful comes our way. And in that way, we empower ourselves with uh, extraordinary levels of communication. And this is one of the, the functions of being able to access this heart-brain harmony. It's, it's beyond simply a, a spiritual tool. What we call extraordinary potential, I personally believe is ordinary potential that we've simply forgotten or only understanding, only beginning to understand and learn about ourselves. And I believe I personally believe that these abilities of self-regulation and of living our lives in states of deep intuition, this is a, an everyday way of being, not something we do 
in a special moment of time and we go into a room in our house and put out the yoga mat and light the candle, burn the incense and turn on the soft music and close our eyes and have our spiritual practice, that's good. But when we most need to be at our best, when we most need the, the greatest capacities of understanding and conscious listening <clears throat> and the ability to go beyond our judgments is when circumstances are usually least opportune. It's when we're in the heat of the moment. We don't have our yoga mat and our candles and our incense and our soft music. It's we're in the real world. You know, one of the interesting things uh, that I experienced when I was leading groups in Tibet in the 1990s and the early 2000s is conversations with the monks. We went to see how they live and they are in awe of us. And they said, it's easy for us to live in this monastery in the top of a mountain where we don't have any relationships with the opposite sex. We don't have families. We don't have the emotional trauma that you experience. It's easy for us to be spiritual and to, to learn about ourselves. They said, but you, you live in the real world. You're out there in the world with different cultures, different people, children, husbands, and wives. And they said, we're in awe of how you do what you do and how well you do what you do. And I was surprised to hear that. And I'd never thought about it from that perspective. I'm surprised to hear that as well. Yeah. Something that, that reminds me of as I was talking to a Kundalini yogi, um, a master guru. And he said, you know, enlightenment is not feel nothing. It's feel everything. No. And we in the real world get the chance <clears throat> to do so more than anyone. From this perspective, enlightenment is the full sensory experience of everyday life without the attachment to the outcome and without the judgment of what that experience means. Well, you make it sound so yeah. simple. Well, that's where our, that's where our mastery begins. Yeah. This is the workshop of life. It can take lifetimes to reach this point uh, where we do not assign so much significance to the events of our lives, to what happens in, in our lives. And that significance is the result of the filters that we develop uh, from the time that we are ch uh, children, childhood. Our programming begins when we're in our mother's womb. And we begin through the chemical signals of her body. If she's in a stressful environment, those chemicals are coursing through our bodies and we become accustomed to stress chemistry, to high levels of adrenaline and cortisol if our mother is in that state. And that influences our development and the way that we think up until the age of about seven years old. The Jesuits uh, knew this uh, a long time ago. And what they would say classically, they would say, give us, give us your children until the age of seven and they'll be ours forever. And what they were saying is, let us indoctrinate them until the age of seven, because from the age of birth to about seven, the brain state is a very receptive state, very open, no filters. And whatever it is that we learn in those years becomes the foundation, the principles that we believe are true, and it's the way we live our lives. So after seven years old, they'd say, you know, you can go home to your families if you want. And they would go home to lives that made no sense to them because they were indoctrinated into a way of thinking that worked with, you know, with the Jesuits. And while we're not Jesuits, it's true for all of us. We all are indoctrinated. <clears throat> through the thinking of our family, we learn to solve our problems through the eyes of our parents and the way they solve their problems when they are, uh, when we are young, when or whoever our caregivers are, whether they are birth parents or whether they are assigned caregivers or an orphanage or an uncle or an aunt. Um, this is where where we learn. We're not defined by those experiences. If they don't serve us, we can recognize that maybe our caregivers learned how to deal with life in ways that were not as healthy as we would choose. And that's where our personal workshop begins. But first, we have to know that we're not defined by our circumstances. We have to know that we have a choice. We have to know that we are soft, emotionally malleable beings, and that our emotions, we can change the filters. We can change the way we choose to be in the world. And it takes three things. It takes the wisdom to recognize that possibility, the courage to move forward and say, yes, this is now my path, and the strength to follow through. So many people make the choice, they never follow through. Or many people make the choice and they say, yes, I'm going to do this. It takes a lot of strength, emotional strength, and 
a deep belief in yourself and who you are so that you are no longer defined by the way other people think. Because when we begin to change the way we think and live, and our friends are used to seeing us one way, some of them sometimes have a problem with that change. If we don't know who we are, then it's very easy to fall back into the old patterns. Perfect place where you're seeing this is with young people today. Young people in the cyber world can be deeply influenced by their peers and what their friends at school or their peers write about them on Facebook, Twitter, social media, YouTube videos. If those young people do not have a rock solid understanding, an emotional anchor that they have acquired from their home life, if their parents and their siblings have not instilled within them a deep truth of who they are, when they go out into the world and they hear that criticism, sometimes they'll believe it. And sometimes they believe it so deeply they feel they have no worth and they'll take their own lives because they believe there is no worth in their lives. If they have those anchors, then that anchor is what sustains them and they still receive the criticism, but it doesn't mean the same thing. What are we deconstructing then? To get to the purity <clears throat> of who we really are. We are steeped in a story, a story of our origin, of our history, of our potential, what's possible in our lives and what's not. And the story now we understand is largely based upon false assumptions of obsolete science. If your story is based upon what you have learned from the academic world, the story that we are the product of random mutations, accidental fusions of genes that just happen to occur and that competition is what's gotten us this far. The new science, the best science of the modern world, and specifically the science of genetics and DNA, we are now able to extract the DNA from the fossilized remains of the beings that we believed we have descended from. And we found out that they are not our, we are not their descendants. They're not our ancestors. We did not descend from Neanderthal, for example. And the same DNA that's telling us who we are not is telling us who we are. And it's telling us that we appeared on this earth. Modern humans showed up about 200,000 years ago, fully enabled and fully intact with everything that we have today. We have the same body proportions, the same brain size, the same neural network, which means our ancestors appeared on this earth with the capabilities that we're talking about to self-regulate their biology. This is a problem for evolutionary science because we're taught that we acquire capabilities as the need arises slowly, gradually, over long periods of time. It appears that we appeared with all of these capabilities fully intact. And the way that the DNA was fused and modified after the fusion to give us the neocortex, to give us the mirror neurons, to give us these abilities that we have, scientists are in agreement that they could not have happened as the product of random evolution. There appears to be an intentionality underlying our existence. Now, this is important because it means life. Our life is something more than the random process. And I personally believe that the hate that we are seeing in the world is because we've been conditioned to discount the value of life, the sanctity of life. We've been taught that life is, is cheap. Uh, it's very easy to take a life if you see it as a video game or if you are uh, inundated with films uh, and movies where life is taken left and right. It's hard to distinguish that uh, and make that distinction from what happens in everyday life. When we begin to instill the, the sacredness of life in our young people again, that's where we begin to heal the hate. And that is where a new world begins. It's about seeing the consciousness. Yeah. Do you think there's an ascension event that will happen? Maybe... Um, sparked by mass meditation, or are we the event? Does it happen individually <clears throat> and collectively as one? Yeah. So people ask me uh, if I believe that we're going to see a mass shift in a moment in time that everyone will recognize. It will, it will be impossible not to recognize that. I, I think anything is possible, certainly. What I'm seeing happening is fascinating to me because I'm, I've had the opportunity to travel the world. I've been on every continent of the earth, except Antarctica, I haven't been to Antarctica. 
uh, not every nation, but every continent. And what I'm seeing is an openness and a willingness among everyday people to embrace new ideas and new ways of thinking because they recognize, number one, the world is changing. Number two, they need to think differently. And number three, what they have been taught is no longer serving them. And I've never seen that kind of openness before. So what I'm seeing is a movement from uh, the grassroots. It's a groundswell upward from everyday people learning about themselves in a way that they were not taught when they were in the university. It's not in the classrooms or the textbooks. Rather than the new ideas being mandated and directed downward through media and through academic circles. So we haven't seen this before. Now, could there be a mass event? There could be. It could be something uh, disclosure. So I, I think we all sense probably that we're not alone in the universe. I think that is almost universally the indigenous peoples have all told us that we are the product of of a relationship with uh, intelligence that is beyond this earth. It means different things to different people. Religions came along and, and they wrapped their rules around what that means and the spirituality, they've got their ideas. Uh, but it has never really been officially acknowledged by, from the top down, from governments and from universities and things like that. Uh, there is a movement asking that that happen. And if that should come to pass, uh, I think that could be a, a catalyst. It certainly could be a catalyst. Uh, if one day we saw motherships appear uh, on every one of the continents, similar to what we saw in the movie, The Arrival, 12 of them showed up on Earth simultaneously, so no one felt left out. And it changed the way that people thought about their relationship to the world. Uh, that certainly could be a trigger. A catastrophic event could be a trigger, and I believe it's not necessary to have that. Uh, we can have the awakening by choice. Humans are funny in that we tend to learn by experiencing first what we don't want before we don't want it, rather than saying, this is what I choose and putting our energy in that direction. It doesn't have to be that way, but we had to have two global wars before we said no more war. We've had to have Holocaust before we say no more Holocaust. You know, we've had to have these atrocities before we, we say no more, rather than choosing to live in honoring uh, all life and all beliefs uh, in a universal sense. So I think anything is possible. What I'm seeing happening right now, barring any external large-scale event, there is an awakening of human consciousness that we've never seen before. And, uh, and where that leads, I think as we embrace the fact that we are a global family. We may not always like one another, but I believe we truly love one another. And I've seen evidence of that. We may not like the habits of one another every day, but when it comes down to life or death, we will lay our lives on the line for, for one another. And that's very unique in, in a species. So I think consciousness, uh, definitely, there is an evolution in consciousness and that evolution is unfolding. It's not being shared in the mainstream media. You're probably not going to see it on CNN or BBC, but we all know it's there. I have to ask about the language of the divine. Sure. What is it? And how do I access it or interpret it? There's a fascinating relationship between the way that we communicate with one another, the way we communicate with our bodies, the way we communicate with the world, and how our bodies respond in the presence of those communications. New discoveries now are showing that the words that we use to communicate every day in our lives direct the way the neurons fire and wire together in our hearts and in our brains. But they go beyond that. The way the words we use do more than influence what we think. The words that we use actually determine what we are capable of conceiving. Now, if you think about what this means, some languages are based in separation. So when we use words of separation, we're actually directing the neurons to fire in a way that invites us to solve our problems based in them and us, in winners and losers, in separation. This is where the spiritual principles of the past come in because our words originally if we follow the traditions of those who have come before us, we're intended 
to be clear conduits for what we were feeling from within. So our words were designed, originally intended, to reflect our innermost emotions and feelings. And our innermost emotions and feelings of unity and of cooperation, of peace and love, those kinds of experiences, when we use the language that reflects those experiences, we actually change the biology of our body so that our body wires and fires to reflect that unity and that healing. So it's a very, very different way of thinking about our relationship to the divine. When we communicate through our, our thoughts, feelings, emotions, and beliefs, we close our eyes and we feel that wholeness and we feel that oneness and that agape love, you know, for all life, every blade of grass, every rock suddenly looks beautiful, you know, and, and, and we're feeling that. We've all felt that at some point. And when we actually communicate the words that reflect that we're actually changing the biology of our body to reflect that wholeness, that's where the healing begins because then the biology begins to come into alignment as well. So this is a very, very different way of, of thinking. There was a, a linguist early in the 20th century, his name was Benjamin Lee Worf, made this discovery with the Hopi language. And what he found was for the Hopi, they have no way of talking about the past or the future. Everything is alive and happening only now. So if you see a wave in an ocean, it's happening in a moment. It's waving. There, you, they cannot say the wave because it is part of all waves and it is happening only now. They can't talk about a wave in the past or a wave in the future. And this idea led to the studies uh, that validate what we're, what we're talking about right now. And in the Hopi traditions, they see the unity of all life. This is their wired now to see uh, everything is alive, everything is conscious, and it's a very, very different way of living and thinking. But when you think that way, you begin to treat your world as alive and precious and conscious, rather than as a dead universe and something to be mastered and then discarded, which is a, a very Western way of thinking. So, uh, so the language becomes a part, a very sacred part of what we're doing. If you've ever thought about words, we take the formation of a word and our communication for granted. And what we're actually doing is a very complex, sacred, extraordinary process. We begin by inviting the breath of life in the most intimate interaction into the depths of our being. We breathe into our bodies. And we nourish and bathe the cells with a sacred breath. And then very skillfully, we tighten the diaphragm and we begin to flutter the muscle of the diaphragm subconsciously and gradually force that air to reverse the path that it took to come into our bodies. And as it leaves, it passes over the muscles of the vocal cords that we will flex and we begin to vibrate in just a precise way so that we create acoustic patterns that mirror what it is that we're feeling and thinking and those patterns we emit into the world to fall upon the eardrums of another being. And we do it by second nature. We do it almost without thinking about it. Very, very powerful. Incredibly powerful. Yeah. Do you think our sentience then is our spiritual guidance system? I think our sentience is the most precious gift that is given to us. No other form of life can feel, sense, acknowledge, interact, share, and give with the world through their sensory experiences and through the emotions uh, and feelings the way that we've been given the ability to do. And as we embrace the deep truths of our sentience, as we honor this deep, precious gift, we elevate ourselves, I believe, to the highest levels of what it means to be human. And in that way, we become the greatest versions of ourselves when we create the greatest world possible. Do you agree with Ronald McCrae's book, Thoughts of Feeling, that if we all become coherent, heart coherent, that we could actually change the world? Is that a tipping uh, point? Yes, sure. the tipping point. Yeah. He says, I think, of 250,000. The Maharishi yeah. effect. So people have asked me from our global family, how many people does it take to create a lasting change in the world? And there have been many ideas that have been 
evolving and have been refined over time. There was a time where the studies suggested the square root of 1% of a given population would be enough to tip the scales. This was from the TM studies that were transcendental meditation studies that were done uh, back in the 1970s, I believe, and, and into the 80s. And what they found was that in statistically significant, or cities over, uh, over uh, 100,000 people, statistically significant change occurred when the square root of 1% of that population would go into the TM process. Crimes against people would decline, emergency hospital room visits would decline, uh, violent crimes would decline. But the problem was, when the people stopped what they were doing, all those statistics reversed because the meditation was something that was done in the moment. And the key, as our ancestors told us, is not what we do, it's what we become. How do we become this way of being? Now, there are other studies that are showing uh, that through the heart-brain coherence, in the presence of heart-brain coherence, the 0.1 hertz influencing populations, that we become more cooperative and less aggressive in the presence uh, of those experiences. And I have found that to be true as well. There's a direct link between the magnetic fields of the earth and the way that we deal with one another. And the bottom line is this, that when the magnetic fields are low, we become more aggressive, less cooperative. When the magnetic fields are high, we just reverse that. We become more cooperative with one another. In the past, we have waited for the planet to give us the higher magnetic field. We now know that collective human hearts, when many people come together in heart-brain coherence, we couple with the magnetic field of the earth and we can actually shift that field in a positive way. The question is, how many people does it take to do that? What the studies are now suggesting is that maybe less about the sheer number of people and more about the quality of the coherence that people are holding to achieve that threshold. So I don't know what the exact numbers are. Uh, I believe it probably takes more than one or two, but out of a planet of 8 billion people, uh, it may not take that many in very clear coherence to tip the scales and stack the deck in our favor. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah, well, we have. We've, we've done that in the past. Yes, absolutely. It's about making it sustainable. Well, what our ancestors told us very clearly, they said it's less about what we do and more about what we become. We must become the very things in the world that we choose to experience in our lives. That's the key. We must become that coherence. So this is a problem in the past. We've taught techniques. People, you know, they go out and party all night and they do whatever they're going to do. And then they come in and they say, okay, I'm going to do my spiritual thing. And they do it for a minute and they say, okay, I did it. And then they go do whatever they were doing. And it's not, it's not lasting. It's not sustainable in that way is there a blueprint for living from the heart so when people ask me do i believe that those who have come before us our ancestors and the most ancient and, and cherished of our spiritual traditions did they leave us a guide or a blueprint of some kind that would help direct us in terms of the changes in our lives and i'm, I'm in awe at the wisdom from our past shared with a people that they could only imagine in their future. They had no way of knowing what the world would look like 2,000 years later. And their words are as powerful and relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago. And, and I go back to the words from the Nag Hammadi, from the Master, from Jesus. If you bring forth that which is within you, it will save you. That which we're bringing forth is our love. And if we do not bring forth that which is within us, it will destroy us. And I find that to be true as well. If we deny love to ourselves, or we deny the love that we have within us to share it with the world, that is a very destructive power because not expressing that potential and not receiving that potential is, uh, is the very opposite of what it is that we're wired to love uh, or to receive in, in our lives. Yeah, we talk a lot about indigenous cultures, but I was wondering, is there a way we can bring that wisdom of initiation back into our culture mm. when adolescents come of age, say, and harness that energy that, you know, 
Angel Wisdom knew was there. You know, in a sense, uh, we're going through a global initiation right now. Many of the indigenous cultures, in Egypt, for example, the chambers where they used to take young people to, uh, to indoctrinate them into adulthood, geologically, those chambers are constructed in a way the magnetic fields are very, very low in those chambers. In the presence of a low magnetic field, you see yourself differently and you see the world differently. And you have to learn to respond to that, where our whole planet now is going through a period of low magnetics. The magnetic fields of our planet are lower now than they've been for the last 2,000 years. Uh, the sun is in a very quiet cycle right now, which means there are very few magnetic storms that are influencing the Earth. And these low magnetic fields will peak in the year 2020, the year of the United States presidential election, uh, and the year when uh, so many nations are making choices about trade policies and sharing vital resources of food and energy and water and communication and defense, all of that's happening right now. In the presence of low magnetic fields, historically, we have been less cooperative and more aggressive. So it is a perfect recipe for human conflict. If you look at human conflict in the past, it occurs in cycles and the cycles are directly linked to the magnetic fields of the sun. So when the sun is quiet, our magnetic fields are lower and human conflict has been on the rise. If we know this is happening, we don't have to succumb to the cycles. We can transcend those cycles. So recently I had the opportunity with Dr. Bruce Lipton. Uh, we were invited to speak at the United Nations about what we see happening in the world, where we see things going, what we can reasonably expect, and as a geologist studying cycles of time and from a biological perspective for Bruce, we shared what I'm saying to you right now. And they were interested. They had never heard, they were amazed. They'd never heard of human conflict occurring in cycles. They thought it is sporadic and happens when it does. And we showed them the charts and the rhythms of, of when the great wars in the past have occurred and when they've ended, when the treaties were signed. They're right on the ebb and the flow of these magnetic cycles. Knowing this, that we are headed now toward the peak of a very low magnetic cycle, uh, it is an invitation to be very conscious about the choices we make, the language we use to extend the olive, olive branch of, of peace and the benefit of a doubt uh, when those communications are, are happening. And that's why we shared this with the UN, but it happens in our personal lives as well. It happens for each of us uh, individually. And when we know that we're in these cycles, we can become aware of them. Harmonizing the heart and the brain is a way to compensate for that because we make our own personal field within which we are communicating. Beautiful. Thank you so much for yeah. your time and wisdom today. No, you're very it's welcome. It's been a true honor. And a